Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, uh, what, a, what a joy to be uh, back in these gatherings, uh, which we were really deprived of, and now increasingly uh, people saying that uh, you know there was just a lot of madness during that time, but unpre unprecedented time. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the gathering. And mashallah, I know a lot of people um, wanted to be here, but because it uh, was so overwhelmingly uh, just uh, desirable that so many of you came out early. And so inshallah, people that are online that weren't able to be here in person, we thank you for just your patience and Inshallah, one day we'll have a, a much larger uh, place to gather. But this is a blessed place. It's a sanctified place. It was built for God at the height of the Depression. And it was given to us by Christians uh, for us to worship our Lord as we understand Him. Alhamdulillah. So, mindfulness is a very interesting uh, term. It's become very popular as Dr. Aisha um, said, one of the things about mindfulness is it, it's actually a relatively recent word. It goes back to the 16th century, but it was almost entirely neglected until about uh, uh, 1965. And from then on, you see this rise. So if you look online, you can see usage and you see this line. It just goes nothing. And then suddenly around the 1960s, it starts to creep up. And by 2019, it's, it's gone way up. And, and there's so many things about mindfulness online. Everybody uh, now has had some experience, if you live in America, especially in California, with this idea of mindfulness. So you have, now they have corporations that have mindfulness. Uh, so they, they have people come and they tell you how to be more mindful. Um, but what's really unusual to me is, what is your mind full of? Because one of the most interesting things about the modern concept of mindfulness, it's actually what we would call dhikr nafs Like you're doing remembrance of yourself. So where does this term come from? I got interested in just, where did this all come from? Well, it came from Buddhism. Because uh, the Buddha, who I actually wrote an article uh, in a book on Buddhism and Islam, a lot of people don't know this, but the Afghanis were actually great Buddhists. And Afghanistan was one of the major Buddhist centers in the, uh, the pre-modern world. And they became Muslim very quickly. Uh, in fact, the great shrine keepers, uh, who are known as the Barmekids, Barmak was not a family. It was actually a clan that kept the Buddhist shrine in Afghanistan. So the Bar Baramika were actually Buddhists that converted to Islam, and then they actually helped bring all of their administrative knowledge into uh, the Abbasid uh, Empire. So uh, I, I think it's very interesting that so many Buddhists became Muslim. And I was struck by the fact that one of the great um, heresiologists and uh, Ash'ari scholars in a book I was reading, he actually had the Buddhists as a, a section in sects, uh, uh, what they call milal and nihal, uh, which is uh, religions and sects. So he had the section on Buddha, and he said, if what the Buddhists say is true about this man, he must be al-khidr, which really struck me. And so then I started researching all of what Muslims have said about Al-Khidr and the parallels between Al-Khidr and Buddhist, Buddha are amazing. So I wrote this uh, article called Buddha in the Quran, question mark. And uh, it was actually translated into Arabic by the Ministry of Awqaf in Morocco because the minister was uh, very uh, struck by uh, the argument. Because Al-Khidr, according to our tradition, was actually a prince who escapes from the palace and goes on this journey in search of knowledge and then has ilm ladunni. It's not revelation, it's a type of enlightenment uh, that happens. So the Buddha talked about 
uh, mindfulness, and he actually has a very famous, uh, in the, it's, it's called Sati Pathana, which is a lecture that he gave on mindfulness. So then I wanted to know, well, what was the word that they translated from mindfulness? And it's a Pali word, which is the original language of Buddha. And in fact, Dr. Cleary argues that in the, what the earliest Buddhist manuscript, which is called the Dhammapada, that the Buddha actually predicted the coming of the Prophet Muhammad So it's very interesting that the word is called Sati. So I looked up Sati, Pali, what, what did it originally mean? I want to know what it originally meant. And it meant remembrance of the sacred scriptures. So it actually literally means remembrance. So it's dhikr. So mindfulness that's been translated into English from Sati is really dhikr. So then it becomes, what are you doing dhikr of? That's the question. Now we live in an age of immense distractions. Arguably this is the most distracted age in human history. Now what does distraction mean? Well, according to the dictionary, it means a state of being distracted. This is what drove people like Derrida crazy. But the second meaning is mental distress or derangement mental distress or derangement. Thank you, that helps. Mental distress or derangement. Now isn't it interesting that we're living in one of the most mentally deranged times in human history where people no longer even know what they are. They've forgotten God. They think that this is all meaningless. And they're completely distracted. So what are they distracted from and who's distracting them? One of the problems with distraction is if you're looking for it, there's plenty of people that will help you find it. And so there are all these merchants out there that are trying to advert, turn your attention toward. That's what advert means, to turn towards. So an advertisement is to entice you and to get your attention. Now, social media was designed to keep you on it. They don't call it surfing the web for nothing. First of all, a web, what do you do with a web? A spider knows what you do with a web. You capture flies, you liquidate their innards, and then you suck the life out of them, and then there's just a shell lying there on the web, right? What's a net? Like, internet? What's a net for? A net's for catching things, right? So. Now, as somebody who actually surfed in my younger days, one of the really interesting things about surfing is you're just trying to stay on. The wave has you. You're not controlling the wave. The wave is controlling you. You're just trying to stay afloat. And so surfing the web, you're just moving, and it's taking you. So distraction creates mental distress. The third meaning in the dictionary is that which divides attention. The word in, in uh, English, decide to decide something, is, comes from a word which means to cut off, decidere. Why would decide mean to cut off? Because what you decide cuts off everything else. Once you've made your decision, you're cutting off other things. And you've made your decision. And so people have to make decisions, like where do you spend your time? What do you give your time to? Now the word in Arabic for distraction is ilha, ilha'un, which means to pull somebody into lahu, to bring them into entertainment which in the dictionary is the pleasurable occupation of the mind. So who's, who's occupying your mind? Now what you give your attention to will determine your reality. What you give your attention to will determine your reality. What does that mean? It means that if you're always watching 
news about crime, you're going to think that crime is far more prevalent than it actually is, and you will be scared. You'll be walking around thinking, like Chicken Little, that the sky is falling. So what you give your attention to is going to determine your reality. And what God is asking us is to give our attention to God. Now what is the, in Arabic intention? What is the attention? Well, in English it has a lot of really interesting meanings. One of them is courtesy. Like you say, he was very attentive to me. Attentions are what a lover gives their beloved. Attention is also a word for devotion. So your attention is your devotion. It's what you're attending to. It's what you're giving your time to. So in Arabic, one of the words for it is ihtimam. It's what you're concerned with. It's your hum. It's what preoccupies your mind. It's what your mind is full of. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن جَعَلَ هُمُومُهُ هَمَّنْ وَاحِدًا كَفَ اللَّهُ لَهُ سَائِرَ الْهُمُومُ Whoever makes his concerns, in other words, gives his attention to one thing, Allah will take care of all of his other concerns. Determined by their understanding of eternity and one of the most common things about pre-modern peoples is they mention death a lot and one of the most notable qualities of modern people and postmodern people is they never talk about death why did the pre-modern people talk about death when I was in the throne room of the former Queen Elizabeth and now the throne room of King Charles uh, I was taken there by Baroness Udin. She's a Muslim in the House of Lords. So they took me into the throne room. I was getting a tour of uh, the parliament. And they have, so they have this throne room. And there was this massive clock given by the French king to the, the British monarch that had the Grim Reaper on top of it. 
that's what the clock had. It had the grim reaper. In other words, the angel of death was on top of it with his scythe that, that takes the souls. In all of, if you look, and Dr. Yusuf knows this because he's been working with sundials, in all of the pre-modern sundials, it will say things like carpe diem, many Latin phrases, things like, in one of these hours you will be seized. People saw time as a reminder of their fi uh, finitude, as the reminder that they were finite beings in temporality. Modern people think they're going to live forever. They don't think about death. And one of the main reasons for this desire for distractibility is because it preoccupies people from thinking about what is inevitable, that they will die. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَكْثَرُ مِن ذِكْرِ هَذَا مِلَّذَّاتِ Do much remembrance of the destroyer of delights, death. Not in a morbid sense. This is being unto death. This is embracing our mortality, being aware of it. Marabat al-Hajj, every night did death meditation. He would recite poems about death. Shaykh ibn al-Habib in his diwan, tazawudu akhi. You know, be prepared for death. Fa'innahu naziru and it's coming. And they used to sing It's one of my favorite Arabic words, akhtara. It literally means, if you look at it, khayr, it comes from khayr. So akhtara is, is a form in Arabic which is, it's to internalize.
the Holy Spirit give you aid in doing that one of the Sahaba who was known for uh, just his humor one day was making all of the Sahaba laugh and the Prophet was there and he poked him in his side like it's enough and the Prophet had a beautiful sense of humor but humor should be like salt it shouldn't be with him he was a he was he was a mufti in the in the UAE in the in the court when I was a student there but he wrote a little book which
of the food and remove from me the harm of the food. This, these are perfect prayers. Perfect prayers. So all of these things that the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to bed, Bismik Allahumma amutu wa ahya. In another riwayah, which is mutafaqun alayhi, he actually says that, Aslam tu nafsi ilayk, I, I have surrendered myself to you. Wafawatu amri ilayk, I have given my whole affair to you. Wal jahtu dhahri ilayk, and put my back. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله
came down, and there are people that do that. So both are correct, but I've always found it difficult not to say Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, uh, don't call him like you call other people. You know, one of the uh, tragedies of the modern time is first name. Every, everybody's on a first name basis. You know, I hate these people, they call you up. Hello, Hamza. I'm like, it's Colonel Hamza to you. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, like, why, why, why do people assume that they can just call you by your first name? P people used to take a long time before you gave them your first name. If you look at the old English, like Jane Austen, they called people by their last name, like Willoughby. That's not his name. His name was John Willoughby, but they called him Willoughby because he was called by his last name. And if it was an elder, then they would call them Sir or Mr. We say Abu Yahya, uh, uh, you know, Abu Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You, you give the kunya. That's how the Arabs do it. One of the things that I realized, because I went to a Catholic school in high school, and they, they always called you by your last name. This was, you know, early 70s, so it hadn't changed yet to the degree. But they always called you by your last name. So, you know, if you raise your hand, they say Mr. Hansen. That's how they called you. And my father went to the same school. And what I realized later is that the whole purpose of that is that you don't just represent yourself, you represent a family, you have a family name, that you shouldn't dishonor your family name. So we're in a time when it's just everybody's an individual. They no longer have any sense of being part of a family or a community. So it's, it's one of the tragedies, I think, of this, all this familiarity. And then, Allahumma had iqbaru laylika wa idbaru naharika wa aswatu duaatika faghfir li, forgive me. You know, this, oh God, now is the arrival of your night, the departure of your day, and the sound of your caller, so forgive me. Imam al-Bukhari. Bismika alladhi la ilaha illa hu wa nandrath to go to the bath or, or sleep. Bismillah, Allahumma jinnibna shaytan wa jinnib shaytan wa jinnib shaytan ma razaqtana. You know, in the name of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يُلَامِسْ أَهْلُهُ If you're going to be intimate, then this is something to say uh, to protect uh, the, the child. أَعُوذُ بِكَرِمَاتِ الْأَيْتَامَةِ مِنْ غَضَبِهِ وَشَرِّ عِبَادِهِ وَمِنْ حَمَسَاتِ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَيَحْضُرُونَ Very, uh, if you wake up from a fright, you say this in sleep. Um, there are many, many of these. I mean, we have beautiful books. Imam al-Shawkani wrote a fantastic book, Tuhfat al-Dhakirin. Imam al nawis great book, uh, Al-Adhkar. It's, it's one of the finest books in our tradition. Um, there are many, and many, many scholars have written small books, like this one that my teacher wrote. Um, the, they want the barakah of teaching these things to people, so it's why people write Tajweed books. Like, I used to really bother me, Tajweed books. I, I see all these Tajweed books. They're all the same. They say the exact same thing. They're all little books, and they say the exact same thing. And I would like, why do people keep writing Tajweed books? Like, aren't there enough Tajweed books? And then I realized it's actually a brilliant thing to do because anybody that learns how to read the Quran from that book, the author of that book gets the reward <laughs> of all their recitation. So it's, this is why Shiuch always made their own awrad. That's I realized that. Because I went like, why do they keep making new awrad? Because they want the reward of the people doing the dhikr that they put together. It's one of the blessings of our religion. So I totally have no problem anymore with that because I get it. I want to do it. Like I'm going to write a book on tajweed, inshallah. <laughs> Allahumma aghfir li dhambi kulluhu diqquhu wa julluhu wa awruhu wa akhiruhu wa alaniyahu. Oh Allah, forgive my sin. This is in prostration. Forgive my sins entirely, the lesser and the greater, the first and the last, the revealed and the concealed. He also said, you know, uh, there are many, many uh, beautiful iterations. Allahumma ghfirli wa rahamni wa hadini wa jburni wa afini wa rzuqni. One of the things of the afia, uh, one of the meanings of it according to Imam al qushayri was to be focused on God. In other words, not to be distracted, which I thought was really interesting. You know, this is between the the tashahud uh, and
things are going to get very serious on this planet. We're, we're entering into a new phase and people need to have strong Iman and they need to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to be connected. I mean, one of the things about Edith Stein that was so amazing, she actually, when, when she fled to, uh, when she fled to, uh, after Kristallnacht, when they were persecuting the Jews, she fled to, uh, they took her to Belgium. And she was in a monastery there. And uh, she used to go out into the cold, like she was preparing for something. And this is an eyewitness people that saw this. She was taken to Auschwitz when the Nazis invaded and they took even the converts to Catholicism because she had converted out of Judaism to Catholicism. But she took her to Auschwitz. There were eyewitness accounts that she was comforting people in that situation. And she only was there for one week. They, she was killed right away. But the point is, is that people of Iman can deal with this. When they, people don't know this, but in Turkey, in, uh, in, in Korea, when they captured the Americans, they captured Turks with them. So they were actually imprisoned together. And when they studied, the Americans all fell apart and they actually started doing uh, uh, recordings for the, Kore for the Koreans, like communist propaganda. And they were very worried about this because they felt they were brainwashed. It was all from the interrogation, but the Turks didn't. They didn't succumb to the interrogation. And they wanted to understand why. And what they found out was two things that the Turks did. One, they laughed a lot because they saw the ridiculousness of what they were trying to do in the brainwashing. So they just would watch these people telling them these things and they thought it was funny. And I, I know that that's from a type of Iman where you kind of recognize the hilarity of this dunya and the stupidity of human beings. And I know it had to do with their upbringing as Muslims. The other thing that they did, they always appointed, because they would take away the officers and the morale would break down with the Americans. The Turks always appointed an Amir. So they always, even when if it was a private, they would appoint somebody over them and he would keep them all together. So these are really, really important things to remember. We need to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's so many things we could talk about. Who are we to talk about the Messenger of Allah? One of my favorite um, poems is from the great, uh, the great poet, uh, the great faqih, uh, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi who is, to me, one of the most extraordinary scholars that our Ummah produced. He wrote a beautiful tafsir of the Qur'an. He was one of those polymaths that just seemed to know everything. Um, one of the beauties of his books, and one of my teachers, Sheikh Muhammad Muqtar Shinqiti, was the son of the great Mufassar. He was the one that really um, first introduced me to Ibn Juzay in Medina when I was very young. But one of the things that really he said was why his books were so powerful is because he wrote them for his son. He wrote them for his son. So he wanted his son to learn from these books. And this is one of the reasons why the sunnah, if, if your parent dies, the sunnah is for the son to pray over the parent, not for the sheikh or the imam. Why? Because nobody will pray with the fervor that a son will pray for his, his parent. So that's one of the secrets of uh, our fiqh. So uh, he said, I attempt to praise the chosen one, but I'm thwarted. I can't get to that, that station, that exalted height of praising him, the Prophet. And then he says, who can measure the ocean and the ocean is vast? And who can enumerate the, the, the stones and the stars? Even if my whole body became tongues, even then I wouldn't be able to give the praise that I desired. وَلَوْ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ الْعَالَمِينَ تَآلَفُوا عَلَى مَدْحِهِ لَمْ يَبْلُغُوا بَعْضَ وَاجِبِي 
If all of creation got together to praise the Prophet ﷺ, they would not achieve that due. They would not achieve that due. فَأَمْسَكْتُ عَنْهُ هَيْبَةً وَتَأَدُّبًا So I have refrained out of awe and adab. وَخَوْفًا وَإِعْظَامًا لِأَرْفَعِ جَانَبِي And out of fear and magnifying that exalted station. وَرُبَّ سُكُوتٌ كَانَ فِيهِ بَلَاغَتٌ وَرُبَّ كَلَامًا فِيهِ عَتْبٌ لِعَاتِبِي And sometimes silence. replied he touched me the black stone laughed and said he kissed me the pebbles yelled we praise God in his palm the mountains of Mecca called out he loved us Medina demurely whispered he chose me and humanity cried, Nafsi, Nafsi, me, me. And God said, Be like Ahmed. And Ahmed said, Ummati, Ummati, my community, my community. And God replied, We will grant you until you are content. <laughs>